Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second session of the Marriage Covenant series. It's so um, such a great privilege to have you all here this morning. And uh, let's just open in prayer and ask our Father to lead us through this session. Thank you, Father, for this beautiful morning and that we can rise as your eaves together to spend time in your word and to learn more of you, Father. We ask that you bless this session, that your Holy Spirit will be present during this entire session, your Ruach, your breath, Father, and that your breath will be blown into us, Father, so that this message will land on a teachable heart, so that the seed sown will take root and grow, Father. I ask that you will also touch my mouth, Father, so that no word spoken will come from me, Father, but only be through your power, through your Ruach, Father. We bless you and we praise you. Thank you for this community where we can share in your word. In the name of Yeshua, amen. So last week, we looked at... Um, the context of the marriage in today's world, we looked at some statistics. We also looked at the meaning of covenant. What is a covenant versus a contract and the foundation of marriage and also the importance of having a balance in a healthy marriage. This week, we will focus more on the relationships in a marriage as well as the boundaries um, that we should implement, but also how various relationships impact the marriage. Um, I really also want to encourage you because we only have a half an hour on Wednesday mornings to go and read the book um, Godly Relationships by Dr. Francie van Weyck. Um, yes, there's so much depth and detail in this book about relationships as well and then the book of Ephesians. So if you go and read the book of Ephesians in the Bible, it also tells us about the various relationships in our lives and how we should um, take care and protect these relationships. So why are relationships so important to God? So remember, last time we spoke, um, we said that Abba Father wants an intimate relationship with us. He seeks and desires his children. He doesn't want us to be in a, a religion, a religious or a routine relationship with him where we just say a quick prayer in the morning and read a quick um, Psalm 117 and then we're done for the day. He wants to be woven into our lives. He wants to be an intricate part of our lives. We also spoke about how your spouse is your counsel, your strength, your strength, your companion, your accountability. So that intimacy that God wants from us is the example of the intimacy that he planned for a marriage, for a covenant. That was his intention from the start. So Abba Father uses relationship to shape us as his children into his image. As Ephesians 5 verse 1 to 2 state, we should imitate God and live a life of love as the Messiah did and be a pleasing fragrance unto God. So all of the relationships in our lives, whether it is with our spouse, our brother, our sister, our friends, our parents, all of these people are instruments that Abba Father uses in our lives to shape us in the process. The word says that iron sharp, sh um, sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. But I think this can also be true the other way around. So if the people that surround us shape us, then we should look at who is actually surrounding us because these relationships will impact every other single relationship in your life. It will also shape you into the person that you are going to become. So if you surround yourself with people that does not seek Abba's truths, that does not spend time with him, that does not desire him as their first love, um, their lives are not centered around God, then systematically you are also going to be drawn further and further and further away from God. But if you surround yourself with people who challenge you 
um, in truth, who challenge you in the word, who teaches you about the word, who um, if you who takes you who le learns you to take accountability for the decisions and the actions that you make, who pray with you, then your relationship with Abba Father will grow into a deeper and more meaningful relationship. So um, I always say that these three questions that I need to be able to answer um, when I'm in a relationship with someone, a friend, um, well, my spouse, but um, any new relationship that I start and time that I spend in a relationship, it's important that I need to be able to answer yes to these questions because then I know that the time, the, the gift that God gives me every day um, I need to take responsibility for how I spend that time and with who I spend that time and if it's for his kingdom and for his glory. So the first question is, after a conversation, do I feel positive, energized, motivated, built up? Do I feel ready for this day that lies ahead of me? Um, you'll usually have coffee with a friend and after that coffee, you feel so full in your heart because it was just this meaningful coffee and it wasn't just about everyday conversations but it really touched your heart the second thing is did this conversation bring me closer to God I believe it's impossible that your heart would have been touched if you didn't mention God somewhere in your conversation if he's so intricate part of your life you won't you won't be able to have a conversation without even mentioning him and then the third thing is, did the conversation bring growth in my life? So did it grow me as a person? Um, so the positivity closer to God and did it grow me as a person? If I answer yes to these questions, I know that this is truly a godly friendship. This is truly a godly relationship. And the way that I am shaped will bring me closer to Yeshua's image. So as I mentioned, the book of Ephesians gives us an overview of the types of relationships in a believer's life. It goes from the relationship that we have with God, ourselves, our spouse, our children, other people, and even the relationship that we should have with our work. And this is how valuable all the types of relationships are to our Father because he instructed Paul to go into detail in all of these. And you can go and make a further study of all of these, but um, I just want to mention that um, you will find your answers in Ephesians and then go and make a study, write out every single relationship in your life as well, write out um, what are the important relationships in your life, what is the key takeaways from each relationship, so what do you maybe need to work on in each relationship so that we can constantly foster and build a relationship where we are shaped into his image, where the relationship's focus is around Yeshua and becoming, transforming into him. And on that, we also need to be the iron that shapes other iron. So that's the transformation process that we spoke about last um, week, is as we transform, we will start to transform others as well. So because God places so much um, emphasis on relationships and because it's so important to him, this is the very place where the enemy attacks God's children. He plans to destroy man's relationships firstly with God, and then he wants to bring division in relationships, division between families, division in marriages, division between friendships, because he knows that if any one of the relationships in your life is chaotic or not in order, it will have an effect on your relationship with God, your marriage, your relationship with your spouse, your family, and your other relationships, because all of these relationships impact one another. But the good news is because of Yeshua and his sacrifice on the cross, he can bring restoration to any, any relationship. Because, he's, because the love that he has for us is so big that he sacrificed himself. He took all of the sin of man upon himself, as well as our father, our father. He sacrificed his son. So this teaches us the value of God's love and how it can bring restoration. 
So if, you, if you're if you at a point with a relationship with someone and you feel like this relationship will never be restored, pray for the relationship. Ask for the same power that raised Yeshua from the dead to um, be active in this relationship, to restore this relationship, because it's possible only through him. Ephesians 1 teaches us that the Messiah chose that the um that God chose us through the Messiah before the creation of the universe. And through him, we have a great inheritance. We have inherited the kingdom of God and we are his sons and his daughters. Ephesians 2 verse 4 teaches us that God's love is so intense and his mercy is so great that, he, that even um, because we are dead, because of our sins and acts of of disobedience we are brought to life we are delivered and that same love and mercy that God shows us should be the basis of all of our relationships and that is the power that we should rely on within our relationships as well so we started to look at God's definition of love um, last week but this week, I want us to dig a little bit deeper into what is true love. And I want you to ask the question, as we go through these definitions of God's love, I want to ask you the question that, can others see this love of God in you? So last week, we looked at the triangle, and the basis of the triangle was the foundation that needs to be God, which is our first love. And then our love will flow over into every other relationship, um, our spouse, and then our other relationships. The word teaches us that God defines love as obedience, firstly, obeying his commands. So he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then Matthew 22, verse 37 to um, 38 teaches us where Yeshua said, Love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. That is the greatest and most important commandment. And the second most important commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. So those are the two commandments in God's word. And it is his truth that we should base our lives on, the foundation according to which we should live our life. It's it's his love letter to us. It's his instruction manual to us. And we shouldn't see it as a list of things or instructions that we should abide in or that we must live by so that we can take it all. No, this shows us that the basis of everything should always be love. So we want to obey his instructions because of our intimacy, because of our love for him. So if we want thriving relationships with others, our foundation with our first love, here it's emphasized again, needs to be in order. And that is why it is the first commandment. And then love your neighbor as yourself. So what is God's love? If we look at the Apostle John in the Bible, he, bought, he built a whole church called the Church of Ephesus. So, and this church was built on the principles of love. He was walking in love. He was walking in God's love. So his, his answer to that question was, yes, um, others can see God's love through me. He had this immense love for God. And because of this love, God gave him the authority, the power to break down the temple of Biana. So the temple of Biana is also called the temple of Artemis. And this was a Greek temple dedicated to an ancient local form of the goddess Artemis. And it was located in Ephesus. And by 1401 AD, it, had, it was ruined and destroyed. So the foundation, the fragments of this temple was destroyed. Um, and this was because of um, what John did why this temple was destroyed. So you can go and read about it. You can also read it about it in Francis' book. I just added where the, the history of the temple comes from so that we understand why the temple had to be broken down. But the moral of the story here is really the power 
that if we operate and walk in God's love, what that power looks like. So if we truly understand God's love, the same power and authority will be in our lives too. Love is the power of God and the manifestation of his presence in you that overcomes the enemy. So again, I want to mention the book of Ephesians outlines all the relationships, but chapter six tells us about the armor of God and what we should do in a time of spiritual warfare. So this tells us a bit that all of our relationships that are so important to God needs to be in order based on love in order for us to step out in boldness with the armor of God to face um, the enemy head on, to, to engage in spiritual warfare. That will give us the authority that only God can give. If we do not do what the word says, then God is not the center point of our lives. And if he isn't the center point, then we cannot walk in his love, his definition of love, because we do not carry the fruit of obedience. And it will start impacting everyone around us and our relationships. So that's why it's so important to always keep God in the God spot. What does this mean? This sounds so strange. So I first heard this concept when I watched a video of Simone and her husband, Andres Pretorius. And this concept really interests me. And I started to... Um, I started to explore it a bit further and see how it is applied to God's word. And it is so um, awesome to see how it rolls out and is applicable to God's word in so many aspects. But first, let's look at the life of Yeshua. So he prioritized his relationship with the Father above everything else. This was his first um, priority. So on a sermon that my husband and I watched the other night, um, the preacher said that he, he asked an interesting question. He said, after a long day at work, what is the first thing that you do when you come home? Do you go and draw a bath? Do you binge watch a series? Um, what do you do? What's the first thing you do to relax? And then, just after that, he asked, what did Yeshua do after a long day at work when he was tired? Um, after a whole day of ministering to people, serving people, praying for people, what he did is he went to spend intimate time with his father. He went up the mountain to spend intimate time with his father. So that's what he did when he was tired. He refueled himself from the energy of God the Father. And from that intimate relationship, from God's love, he refueled himself so that the next day he can go out and minister to people, teach again, and pray for people again. And that same dis um, example can be used when we look at his disciples. He surrounded himself with 12 close disciples, which we know Peter, John, and James was his closest and he had the most intimate relationship with John. You can go and look at John 13, verse 23. So why am I telling you all of this? Because if we look at our relationships in our lives, it's important that we keep God in the middle, in the God spot. And we prioritize our time firstly to God, then our spouse, then our, um, our close relationships, and then others. So we need to have a balance and healthy boundaries when it comes to relationships. Why? Because relationships takes time. Relationships reveal something about your heart, the different layers of your heart. Relationships are um, intimate. It requires intimacy. It requires commitment. It requires sacrifice. And your relationships also requires protection. But as we said earlier as well, iron sharpens iron. So your relationships also determine who is this person that I am going to become. So here we can see God is in the middle. He's in the God spot and we prioritize him. Um, as Yeshua did, he's the center of everything. We plan our day around him. I just want to mention here as well, if God is in the God spot, 
when you seek advice, when you want to vent, when you are sad, when you have an idea, when you are excited, when you have new news, all of that will be something that you bring firstly to God, not to your husband, not to your mom, not to your best friend. It will be firstly to God. That is when God is in the God spot. But the moment that you first seek others' advice or first ask other people to pray or first um, share something new with someone else, then you are putting someone else in the God spot. And then we, we are starting to touch a dangerous zone, which is idolatry, idolatry. So then we make an idol of someone else because God is not in the God spot. So in the notes, I've included quite a few scriptures on idolatry, which you can go and um, read up on. I'll send the notes after the session on the Rise Eve's group, the announcements part. And then further, Ephesians 5 warns us about the actions, words, and thoughts we should not engage in um, as people. And we should not become partners with people who do engage in these things. It's, it comes back to the concept of iron sharpens iron. We must not live in darkness, but because we are children of the light, we should operate as children of the light. And then the last comment on this circle is, this is not to say that you shouldn't have a lot of friends or you shouldn't have people that you spend time with, but it is important that you go and set healthy boundaries for yourself to ensure that this circle is always in alignment. God is always at the center. Then it is your spouse. If you are married, this is where your spouse comes in. If you are not yet married, um, even if you're only engaged, this will be the spot where your parents and your family comes in. The moment that you get that you get married, your spouse enters this circle, and your parents goes into the straight, uh, the close relationship circle. And then the close relationships is where your close family, your parents, would be. Um, if you're married with children, this is where your children would be as well and then others. So we should be careful which part of our hearts we share with others and how we fill our cup um, of time that our Father has given us with a gift, as a gift. So um, then we're go going to delve into the relationship um, types. So I'm going to go through these quite quickly because I see we are a bit short of time. But firstly, the, um, I didn't put it in the slide because we've covered it quite a lot. The first relationship is the relationship with God that we already discussed. And this is our first love. We know that he chose us before the foundations of the earth and he adopted us as his children. But there are, however, barriers and blockages. So you'll see on the slides I've looked at it um, the a short description in the slide uh, in the slide notes there's a lot more description that you can work through and then the attack of the enemy because remember we said that the enemy wants to attack every single relationship that we have so I'm going to identify some of the attacks but I want you to throughout this week go and write down each and every one of these relationships and go and write down where you can truly see the enemy attacks this relationship of yours and engage in spiritual warfare against those attacks of the enemy. So where does the enemy attack the relationship that you have with God? Firstly, have a, having a poor relationship with your earthly father. So if your image of fatherhood is distorted, you will find it difficult to accept God as the father. And then divorce is another plan the enemy uses to give children a distorted view of families and remove fathers from their families. So because God is our father, he wants to change the image that we, want, that we have for a father. So if this is something that's, that's um, in your evident in your life, go and break those chains. Go and pray against that. Intercede against that. Use the Rise East group so that we can intercede with you. So it's really important that you need to go through a process of restoring the image of a father. And this process, remember, all of the restoration processes starts with repentance and forgiveness. 
so that you can forgive your father so that you can be free of pain and start to believe that father God really loves you. Then the second relationship is the relationship with yourself. I think so often many of us are guilty of this, but God expects us to delight in who he made us to be. He wants us to have a healthy and vibrant relationship with ourselves. What does it mean to have a healthy relationship with yourself? It means that you don't want to be anyone else but yourself, but the person that God created you to be. He expects us to love ourselves. If we go back to the second commandment and we look carefully at it, let me just quickly flip back to it. The commandment here says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So what does this tell us about the scripture? It tells us that if you don't love yourself, it's going to impact the way that you love your neighbor. So it's very important that we love ourselves. Um, God created each of us with a unique purpose and he expects us to live a life worthy of the calling that he created us for. Not because we are great, because he invested in us when he created us. And we want to live up to that investment and the working of his power through us so that we can step into the purpose that he created us for. So the attacks of the enemy here can be self-rejection. It can be comparison to others. It can be rejection from others, negative words from others. So if you start to internalize words that other people say about you instead of what God says about you. So go and do a word study. Go and write down all of the scriptures of what God says about you and proclaim that over yourself every day. If there's a part of yourself that you do not love, go and ask God, why did he specifically create you in that way? And then um, you can start to learn to love yourself in that way because it's very important that this foundation of loving self not pridefully loving ourselves for who God created us to be and loving um, that we have purpose in him not because of pride or who we are but because who he made us to be and then we've covered the spouse quite a lot and next week we'll also continue with your relationship with your spouse but it's important that in our relationship with our spouse, we need to follow God's guidelines of love in our marriage. That's not to say that emotion is not important, but if we base our emotions on marriage, then manipulation can quickly enter in. Manipulation can take many forms. It can be money, it can be intimacy, but the enemy also wants to attack the marriage in terms of bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness, um, he uses intimacy, he uses manipulation in the church. But we should um, look at Ephesians, specifically Ephesians 5, that gives us guidelines that wives should submit to their husbands and husbands should respect their wives. I've also shared a, um, a series that, uh, a, a sermon that I've watched or a YouTube videos that I watch, it's not a sermon. Um, about what it means to really submit to your husband. So you can scroll back on the Rise Eves group and watch that as well. It really changed uh, my life quite a bit. And then children, we're running out of time. So I'm just quickly going to cover the children part. Um, but the year I had to consult Francis book quite a lot because I do not have children yet myself. But um, what was really interesting here, or, or not interesting, what was really valuable here is that we should base our parenting styles and our principles that we teach our children always on the word. We should teach them the, the discipline of the word. We should teach them the boundaries of the word because children that do not grow up in boundaries will take advantage of authority. So love without boundaries and discipline isn't love. And the enemy wants to attack this parent-child relationship, especially when it comes to rules, when it comes to instructions, when it comes to boundaries. Children will always test the boundaries. And they model the relationship that their parents have with each other, with others, as well as with God. 
And then the last two relationships is the relationships with parents and the relationships with others. So I've added quite a few notes on these two relationships. What I just want to highlight here is that um, first, this uh, the, what I said here at the bottom, we should view all of these relationships in the context of the God spot. So you should always have the correct boundaries when you look at the context of the God spot. Relationship with parents, I want to emphasize that Abba Father doesn't ask us to honor our parents. He commands us to honor our parents, to give them glory. Kavot is the Hebrew word, to give someone glory. He chose our parents, so we need to honor and respect them. Once you get married, your parents-in-law becomes your, your um, another set of parents. But you shouldn't view them as a second set of parents. You should treat them with the same honor and respect that you would treat your own parents. And it's your responsibility to develop a relationship with your parents-in-law. So go and read the notes on the parents. It's really, really, really important that we have a solid foundation and um, a solid relationship with our parents. That doesn't mean that we always agree with everything that they say. It means that the way in which we disagree with them comes from a place of honor and respect. And then the relationship with others, I just want to mention that people are the crown of creation. And if we view them from a viewpoint of God's eyes and how he created them, that would really start to change the dynamic of how we treat them. And remember, as you, love, as you love yourself, you should love others. So if there's a gap in how you love yourself, there will be a gap in how you love others. That means your parents, your family, your spouse, everyone else. And then I just want to conclude with Ephesians 1, verse 16 to 20. Um, and this is really my prayer for everyone this week. So I'm going to close in prayer by praying this verse over you. And I really want to bless you with this verse in this week. May the seeds that were sown today really take root and grow in your hearts. And may you go and study more in depth the various relationships that God regard as so important. So I'm going to bless you with Ephesians 1 verse 6. Abba Father, I ask that you bless each and every Eve that is here today, that is on the group that will listen to this in the future, and each and every Eve that you created here on this earth, Father, that you will bless them this week. Um, and I ask you, God, um, to give them a spirit, us, all of us, a spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that we will have full knowledge of him. I pray that you will give light to the eyes of our hearts, so that we will understand the hope to which you have called us. What rich glories there are in the inheritance that you have promised us as your people, and how surpassingly great is your power working in us who trust you. It works with the same mighty strength you used when you worked the Messiah to raise from the dead and seat him at the right hand in heaven. May you all be blessed and have an awesome week in our Abba Father. Bye.